Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy that you were all able to join us this evening uh, in our discussion about vascular anomalies and how an interventional radiologist might uh, not only diagnose, but also manage these, especially in the pediatric population, as this is a, a spectrum of disorders that we frequently encounter. I want to introduce uh, my co-panelists here, Dr. Gilreis Chaudhry of Boston Children's Hospital. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Chaudhry. Hello. Hello. Welcome. And uh, Dr. Ann Saylor, who is uh, going to begin an interventional radiology fellowship next year at Yale. Uh, thank you so much, Ann. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, we'll sort of begin our discussion of vascular anomalies and, and really malformations by talking about it in two parts. Uh, I'll start by talking about the ISSVA classification, uh, very briefly about protocoling vascular malformations. Uh, and, and how to hang them in such a way that you can come to a reasonable diagnosis if you're on a diagnostic rotation or if you're in a clinic at some point in your life trying to figure out what you'd like to treat. And then from there, uh, speaking a little bit more about the specific types of more simple malformations uh, with some commentary on how we treat them. In our second part, I will defer to uh, Dr. Chaudhry to take the helm there, uh, and he will lead us through overgrowth syndromes associated with vascular anomalies. And then we'll have a discussion at the end about what goes into creating a vascular anomalies clinic, uh, some of the practice patterns, the operations and successes of what has happened at Boston Children's Hospital and how uh, in the future, some of us who may be treating pediatric patients might find ourselves in that setting. For those of you interested, if you have a smartphone that can pick up uh, QR codes or you have a QR reader, uh, I've got a couple here. If you want a, a little reminder, you can check out this vascular malformation cheat sheet that I created beforehand. You can just sort of look at that on your phone to take you to a Google Doc site. And at the same time, there's a PDF version of the ISSVA classification that is freely available online. And that can be found at this other QR code if you just hold your phone with the camera up to these uh, barcodes here. So a little bit about the ISSBA. Uh, it's a classification system that was first described in 1982. Uh, the classification system specifically was adopted in 1996 in Rome by the ISSBA proper, um, ISSBA standing for the International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies. And every two years since then, uh, there's been a, an updating meeting sort of to talk about the current status of, of how we think about vascular anomalies, which is split into two groups, vascular tumors and vascular malformations. Today, we're focusing mainly on vascular malformations, which include simple, combined, uh, those related to major name vessels, and then those associated with syndromes or other anomalies. Just a, a, a brief part about talking about how you might want to protocol these or think about hanging these is that to assess one fully, there's a T2 fat saturated sequence that can generally be helpful to find flow voids related to arterial issues, cystic structures which could, which could show up in veins and lymphatic uh, anomalies, and then edema in the adjacent bone or tissue should show up quite nicely in a fat saturated sequence um, with T2 weighting. T1 is going to be really great for finding those flow voids again, but also be very sensitive to fat, show you bulk fat in a lesion, and then also help you to clearly define anatomic tissue planes. And a T1 post-contrast fat saturated image after the administration of gadolinium-based contrast in MRI is going to be able to show you which vessels are filling and when they are filling, so excellent temporal resolution, and also can help you to identify the number and the size of feeding or draining vessels. And this is particularly important when procedure planning. I recommend hanging all of your sequences like this with the T2 at the left side of your monitor, the T1 in the middle, and then the T1 post contrast at the other side. It helps to keep everything sort of straight, and it'll be how I show every case that we review in this first portion here. Reformatting in multiple plates is always helpful to, to characterize the anatomic planes of the, of the lesion. And while I don't have them here, maximum intensity projections, basically things that are able to take the some of the brighter pixels and or voxels, I should say, in cross-sectional imaging and, and make them show up the most are going to help us to delineate vascular anatomy from other tissue structures much easier. So the first type of, uh, or the first group that I'll discuss here um, with our, our co-panelists' help are going to be our simple and combined anomalies. Something that we might commonly come across in a, in a clinic might be these capillary malformations, which very frequently are going to be your port wine stain. They tend to be some of the more common anomalies that we encounter, and they're often associated with other underlying malformations uh, that could be deeper to these structures, either within muscle or within 
uh, soft tissue or bone uh, adjacent to them. So sometimes I, I often think about capillary malformations as sort of the tip of the iceberg and that we should look deeper into finding these. Uh, you might hear them referred to as a port wine stain, which should serve as sort of a buzzword to a capillary malformation. Dr. Chaudhry, I'm interested into how you approach um, a child or a patient who might come into the clinic with a capillary malformation and what some of your next steps are in your thought process. I think it depends on whether the capillary malformation is an isolated finding or whether it's associated with an overgrowth syndrome. Obviously, in both of these patients, is associated with an overgrowth syndrome, and uh, you can see some lymphatic vesicles over the capillary malformation. I mean, isolated capillary malformations, we don't necessarily get involved with in terms of interventional radiology because there are very limited therapeutic options. So um, I think that's, so generally, if they weren't to come into clinic, we would see them in, in, that, uh, in consultation with a dermatologist. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Moving on, uh, with another case, a little bit more of a deeper malformation. This is, in this particular instance, a one-day-old female with a large head and neck mass. You can see that our uh, T2 fat-saturated sequence has a, a large cystic structure here uh, with T1 darkness associated with it, which could appear somewhat maybe darker or iso-intense to the adjacent muscle. And after the administration of gadolinium-based contrast with fat saturation, the area does not fill in, suggesting that it's not very vascular, nor is it connecting to vascular channels. The combination of these findings here would lead us to a lymphatic malformation. And something to consider in these lymphatic malformations, uh, especially of the head and neck is where they tend to frequently arise, is that every once in a while these could become super infected after they might experience some hemorrhage within the lesion leading to a predisposition to some sort of infection. In fact, one of the next cases I can show you here is exactly that. This is the same patient, but a year later, with this transpatial T2 hyperintense septate cystic structure, again, again with the fluid fluid levels, but this time they are far more obvious to the eye. Notice that here, this, this layer here, which uh, again demonstrates hypo intensity or iso intensity to the adjacent muscle, but after the administration of contrast, there's far more septal enhancement. There's more of an enhancement, not necessarily of the cystic spaces themselves, but the areas uh, surrounding them. And this would be concerning for super infection of these lymphatic malformations. Moving on to an ultrasound appearance of these, we see a very uh, common correlate where you, again, you have these uh, well-defined lobulated fluid filled cysts, which are anechoic. And when you put color Doppler over these lesions, it's these cystic spaces that just aren't filling in, suggesting that they are not connected to vascular channels. Dr. Chaudhry, uh, when approaching macrocystic uh, lymphatic malformations, what are your uh, thoughts on treating these and how would you go about doing that? I mean, I think if you have a, a significant macrocystic lymphatic malformation, I would advocate generally treatment regardless of whether they have symptoms or not, but really like in the patient that you showed. In fact, you could see how complex the malformation was one year later, so that's why I would advocate treating early in those, and you could, you know, I think it's a malformation that would be much easier to treat when there were much larger macrocysts. You know, if you have a, a small isolated macrocystic lesion, then you could certainly leave it alone, but most of these patients at some point will develop intralesional hemorrhage or, or possibly superinfection. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I would imagine that it would be safer to wait until the infection resolves in however way you do that before you begin um, a sclerotherapy or, or some sort of a, an embolic procedure. Uh, commonly, but not always. Sometimes if it's um, yeah, super infected, but the patient is uncomfortable, I would still treat it. Very good. Thank you. The counterpart to the macrocystic lymphatic malformation uh, is met sometimes with a lymphatic malformation that we might not very easily be able to identify uh, like a macrocystic. In fact, sometimes there can be just some asymmetric swelling. In this person with jaw swelling, this is a one-month-old female, the, the right side uh, versus the left side, you can clearly see that there's a lot more soft tissue in this hemimandible versus the opposite side. And as a result, um, of more grayscale imaging. There's just a lot of soft tissue thickening with a lot of heterogeneous echogenic cystic and solid structures that could be difficult to tell the difference between. And there's some minimal intrinsic vascularity, not necessarily corresponding to the cystic spaces again, but rather the septae that are just so tiny that it's very difficult to delineate between cystic and septate 
tissue. Um, this would be an ultrasound characteristic of a, of a microcystic lymphatic malformation. And I would imagine that treating a microcystic versus a macrocystic would come in, in two different flavors and, and would be a lot more difficult to do. Yes, I mean, microcystic lymphatic malformation is much more challenging. I mean, I think a macrocystic lymphatic malformation, almost regardless of whatever sclerosin to use, tends to respond very well. Microcystic, on the other hand, you're restricted to sclerosin such as bleomycin, and even then, the the results are nowhere near as, uh, as satisfying. Mm -hmm. I I would imagine then for microcystic lymphatic malformation, there's probably a lot of multidisciplinary association with some of the of, of the surgeons and maybe even some of the dermatologists to go in and help with some of the the thoughts of treating these. Yes, I mean it depends on the the extent of it. If it's very focal, then yeah, you can certainly do sclerotherapy alone. But you know, if you're transpatial um, combined malformations or predominantly microcystic malformations, we will actually work with our hematologist most closely and with and who will prescribe serolimus and we can score those at the same time. Terrific. Moving forward, uh, changing uh, gears a little bit, we've got another patient with a leg lump behind their knee. And if you notice here on the T2 fat saturated sequence, and if your memories are good, you might notice that this is one of the example cases I showed earlier. You'll notice that there are these cystic channels behind the knee within the soft tissue uh, that appear just ectatic, and, and clearly they are cystic because they are T2 bright, even in the presence of fat saturation. And on this axial display here, this is a, a better area to show these cystic channels behind. Now, on the T1-weighted sequence, there is some fat interspersed within the lesion, and after the administration of contrast, there is a gradual incomplete enhancement at the current time that the image was acquired, but there is some enhancement of these cystic spaces again. So, contrary to the lymphatic malformation that we saw before, this one is enhancing uh, despite similar T1 and T2 characteristics before. This lesion would be characteristic of a venous malformation. Now, when it comes to venous malformations, uh, really the standard of care now, as I understand, is that sclerotherapy and embolization really are superior, at least in, in efficacy and minimal invasion relative to surgery. And there's a, a wide array of, of uh, sclerosins that are we can use now for the treatment of these uh, lesions. Is that correct? Yes, the, the vast majority of venous malformations now would be treated by sclerotherapy. Um, it's unusual to require you know, do primary resection. There are certainly some lesions where um, we would perform sclerotherapy and then it's followed by resection, but the, the majority would be sclerosed, uh, predominantly using uh, STS or alcohol. Mm -hmm. I'm going to advance here. So with slow flow malformation treatment, it seems, you know, this is an example of one that was treated. Um, after the administration of the uh, contrast sclerosin mixture. And you can see that after the, the size of the malformation was significantly reduced. Um, the, this patient particularly actually experienced a, a very rapid resolution in their symptoms, which was, which was terrific. Moving here, uh, continuing in a similar vein, and the pun was completely intended there, uh, there's a, a T2 fat saturated sequence with again, these cystic channels uh, that on T1 appear similar to the uh, similar to the signal of the adjacent muscle. Um, there is some fat interspersed within the lesion, as we saw again, within the muscle itself, displaying avid contrast enhancement after the administration of gadolinium-based contrast. Notice that there is no arterial enhancement here. And what I'm showing again is another example of a venous malformation. This one just happens to be within the muscle. Uh, do on our... Uh, Time resolved MIP sequences here. We can see that early angiographic phase is showing normal three vessel runoff to the extremity. However, later on with some delay, there's more soft tissue enhancement uh, in the left lower extremity versus the right lower extremity in keeping with this patient with a, a venous malformation within the muscle. When these venous malformations are embedded in muscular tissue, is there a different treatment strategy or are you able to continue with percutaneous sclerotherapy as you would any other malformation? I mean, this particular lesion is, yeah, I think it's closer to fava than a, a venous malformation, which would be fiber adipose vascular anomaly, mm -hmm. um, just because of the, the amount of fat within the lesion. And often these lesions tend to be quite fibrotic. Mm -hmm. um, so sclerotherapy in lesions such as this is often uh, not particularly satisfying. You may get some 
temporary relief, but uh, often these symptoms recur and sometimes are worse than when you started. So for for these, we would use either, uh, if you have focal symptoms, you could use cryoablation, or the other thing to work with is your orthopedic surgeon, you may be able to actually resect the entire muscle. This one may be more a bit more difficult, just a slightly deeper than the, the ones you would normally see around the calf. I see. And for our correlates, at least with ultrasound on grayscale, we can again find these tubular ectatic channels um, that should be compressible like other veins. Um, at the same time, though, when we put color Doppler over them, these do fill in with some sort of flow signal. And when we confirm this with spectral Doppler, we can find venous waveforms within these tubular channels. These would be consistent with venous malformations on the ultrasound. Changing gears again, this is an older patient, an adolescent, 14 years old female with a painful foot mass and, and a toe ulcer. Uh, we notice that on a T2 fat saturated sequence that we can see arterial flow voids, which are these dark areas, uh, sort of uh, the serpentine structures over the first uh, metatarsal. And there is some surrounding soft tissue edema, as we're able to see as well. There is fat interspersed within the abnormal serpentine arteries, as we can see sort of in this fast moving GIF. I apologize if it's not projecting on your screens quite well, but on this still image here, we can see some fat within it. Again, our T1 is excellent for finding our fat within lesions. And then after on our arterial phase, we're able to see early arterial enhancement of a lot of what we originally described as flow voids. And on some delayed imaging, we could see some early filling of some veins higher up in the foot. Given that we have some arterial and venous enhancement with some fast flow in these flow voids where the MR is not able to pick up the, the speed of the, of the flow through these vessels, this can help us come to the diagnosis of an arterial venous malformation. Taking these patients to angiography to further diagnose these and potentially treat, you can see with this fast moving one here, there are multiple arterial feeders to this large nidus and really an arterial venous malformation to, to separate it from an arteriovenous fistula would be the presence of a nidus. Um, in an arteriovenous malformation, you're looking for a, a central nidus. Sometimes it can be quite, quite mass-like where the arteries will sort of come together and form uh, a common channel and then some of these veins will take it away. There are a couple of different classifications. Uh, I believe that the this, in this paper, uh, the Schobinger classification is more of a clinical classification um, described by signs and symptoms, whereas this classification described in Park et al. in a 2012 uh, issue of JBIR describes it with the anatomy of the feeding vessels, but also the draining veins. And you can see that more commonly in some of the simpler ones in type 1 and type 2, there's almost always a common draining venous channel. Given that there are multiple draining venous channels coming from this one in the lower extremity. Uh, this is at least a type three according to this specific classification. Uh, in your experience, Dr. Chaudhary, what kind of methods do you use to classify these arterial venous malformations and how does classifying them and then also your workup help to determine how you'd like to treat these? I mean, predominantly what you're looking for is a common draining vein. Um, yeah which you know, here would be a type one, type two, and you know, and Wayne Yakes has a similar classification as well. Um, but in terms of treatment, that's essentially what you're looking for. Any malformation that has a large common draining vein is significantly easier to treat from the venous end um, as compared to the much more challenging uh, malformations seen in type 3A, type 3B, where you have multiple arterial feeders as well as draining veins. Definitely. I, I would imagine, um, I would hope at least that type one and type two being more simple are, are going to be more of the common ones that you find. Uh, when it comes to recurrence of these malformations or repeat treatments, do you stage these procedures if they tend to be more complicated? What is your approach to that? Yeah, it really depends on the, you know, the size and location of the malformation. If you can uh, sometimes if you say it's a large malformation, say in the pelvis, you can treat that with in one treatment. Now that doesn't mean that you will never require embolization again, but it just means you don't have to stage it. Whereas other pa patients, especially ones with very small um, draining veins, you will need to have multiple procedures performed. I see. Very good. Thank you. 
again, with our ultrasound correlate, we can find that there are clusters of anechoic tortuous tubular channels around a central nidus. And the central nidus I was hoping to capture on this GIF here that you can sort of see coming in and out of the plane. Moving forward, showing color Doppler over the area would be expected to have robust flow with color aliasing, which is a combination of sort of this blue and red and some orange and yellow mixed in there, suggesting that there's a degree of turbulent flow, um, you know, going away from the, the expected laminar flow through a normal vessel. And when we put spectral uh, Doppler over these, there is a baseline venous waveform over some of it, but with a lot of arterial waveform sort of shining through in other areas of the same malformation in this patient, you can get some clear arterial waveforms and simply moving it maybe within a couple millimeters of each other, you can get easily some, some venous superimposition. Now, given that there can be a nidus in the middle of it with a common draining vein, you would often expect there to be some arterialization of the waveform of the vein when, uh, when appreciating these venous channels because of this high pressure, low resistance system. Uh, the spectral broadening, which is characterized by the filling in of these gray lines in the spectral waveform, also suggests a degree of turbulence within these channels. A combination of these findings would lead us to the ultrasound diagnosis of an arterial venous malformation. Another case here uh, to underscore the importance of, of how severe some of these malformations can be, especially why a clinical correlation is, is definitely needed by the interventional radiologist in a clinic, would be that sometimes these malformations can happen in visceral organs. This is an example of a one-day-old female with failure to thrive, and on her ultrasound initially, there was an abnormal draining or an abnormal vascular channel within the liver going to the inferior vena cava with mixed arterial and venous waveform with arterialization of the venous waveform pattern, especially in the hepatic veins where we have our calipers over. And this is just repeating as I was saying, but moving over to her cross-sectional imaging, um, you can see as we approach the liver that there's a large nidus with large uh, feeding arteries and then a predominant draining vein through the right hepatic vein to the inferior vena cava. And it's important to also know some of the peripheral signs in this imaging because you notice that her right atrium and right heart is significantly enlarged. Her entire heart is quite large for that matter because there's a lot of venous return. Uh, a lot of these arterial venous malformations place patients at risk for heart failure early on because there is a high venous return, low resistance uh, circulation that is sort of overloading the heart with um, its flow dynamics. You can see that this is the common channel off to the side here with a large draining right hepatic vein to the inferior vena cava, and then within the nidus, uh, just an abundance of feeding vessels um, to it. I would imagine that there's also, as we were talking before, when you're seeing a venous malformation, specifically say in a muscle, you wonder about the specific, you wonder about the, the likelihood that it could be a fava type lesion, which I know you'll get to in the next portion of this talk. But when you have arterial venous malformations in solid organ viscera, is there a different thought process or treatment approach that you would take uh, given that circumstance? Sorry, I didn't catch the last one. I was wondering if when you find arterial venous malformations, not necessarily in an extremity, but in solid organ viscera, is there a different treatment approach that you would take to those lesions? Um, not for the most part. I mean, I think if you can, again, yeah, go from the venous end and you can occlude as much of the venous outflow as possible here, you know, using a combination of coils and possibly and then, and then glue. Um, no, I think you you can that's the approach I would take for this as well. Um, but obviously it depends on the exact organ it's involved in, but you, the only advantage here, you could also, this one, you could also percutaneously access. Gotcha. Yes, and I would imagine that could be helpful, at least getting initial access as well, to just go through the skin and, and through the liver as well. Yes, I mean, I think so for something like this, you'd get arterial access, probably access through the IJ, and then percutaneous approach as well. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, going away from the simple lesions, the combined lesions, just a brief note, oftentimes we might encounter combinations of, of these anomalies in the same type of lesion, sometimes capillary and venous malformations together, um, capillary and lymphatic, or really any sort of combination that you can imagine. The ISSVA has a specific um, understanding of what we call these in a very uh, well-defined vernacular, so to speak. I know that there's a, a, sometimes a lot of confusion whether to call something truly, say, a uh, 
lymphatic venous malformation versus the, I guess, the older term, the venolymphatic malformation, which I know is, I guess, we're we're encouraging it to fall out of favor as we as we discuss these further. And then uh, there are some other types that could be of na major name vessels. The ISSBA doesn't necessarily go into the specifics of what it would call uh, one of these. Uh, sometimes it could be one named of very specific vessels that we know of. It could be persistence of embryonic vessels. It could affect any type of channels that we can imagine, lymphatics, veins, or arteries. Um, I suppose if you were to stretch your imagination that a persistent sciatic artery could in theory be considered some sort of a vascular anomaly by a major name vessel because this is a persistence of an embryonic vessel here. And you can see through my fast moving uh, CT that it actually traces posteriorly. And in this particular patient, now they do have um, anterior circulation through the iliacs and the femoral, but in somebody who might only have a persistent sciatic, this is somebody who might develop claudication or lower extremity arterial insufficiency uh, when sitting down or, or having a high muscular compression of that vessel adjacent to it. Other ones that we might come across more commonly because these are named vessels could be um, patients who present with strider, given that they could have right arches with aberrant left subclavians causing uh, compression of the airway as it goes down. This would be an example of an anomaly of origin and course. And something more commonly seen could be a duplication of a vessel. Um, as we said, this could be an anomaly of number or persistence of an embryonic vessel. And in this case, this person has two superior vena cavas. This is one of them, the, the original one on the right side, and this is one draining into the coronary sinus on the left. This would be an anomaly of origin course and vessel number. And also more commonly, especially in young patients who we see in the pediatric side, there could be a line placement that could be quite scary when you're seeing it on a radiograph where the line is coming down on the other side that you would expect it. And you might be afraid to see this. Could it be arterially placed? Could it be um, not in a vessel at all and rather in the pericardial space or in the mediastinum? Um, it's always important to, to check back on the, on the tube and, and run it for some tests to make sure that you're going in the right direction. Um, but oftentimes it could just be in a left-sided SVC uh, or a duplicated IVC or SVC, and that could be uh, reassuring because it, it is going to the right location, just on the other side. Now, shifting gears to the second part of our talk, which I will give Dr. Chaudhry the helm here to discuss overgrowth syndromes associated with those vascular anomalies and then to continue in our discussion about the vascular anomalies clinic. Uh, Dr. Chaudhry, I'm going to change the presenter and give you control um, of the screen. Are your slides ready to go? Sure, yeah. Okay, I'm going to give this to you. And when you're ready, I believe that, yep, there we go, perfect. Okay. Okay, so we'll just basically briefly review overgrowth syndromes and uh, some of the imaging some of the, and the characteristics of it, and we'll briefly mention some of the inter interventional treatment. Um, so stuck at the, you know, back end of the classification, is these vascular malformations associated with the other anomalies. And it's a, you know, really wide spectrum of conditions, um, but we'll really concentrate on the most common ones. Uh, and also in the appendix, there's an, another list of conditions where the PIC3CA related overgrowth spectrum of these will concentrate predominantly on KTS and CLOSE. So I think of these, probably the ones to, um, that we see the most often, or I think is worth studying, are these five conditions KTS, CLOSE, Parks Weber, P10, and Proteus. So KTS, as we we mentioned earlier is a combination of capillary venous and lymphatic malformation. Uh, the vast majority of patients will have one extremity involved and usually the lower extremity. And there is associated local overgrowth. And the local overgrowth is predominantly due to uh, lymphatic tissue and fat within the subcutaneous, uh, subcutaneous regions. But one thing to note in these patients is the persistence of embryonic veins, particularly the lateral marginal vein of Cervelle as well as a sciatic vein, which we'll see in a minute. So this is a uh, child with a Kubota-Noni syndrome. As you can see, there is a capillary malformation here, as well as significant amount of uh, 
overgrowth, which is a combination of uh, lymphatic disease as well as a bit of fatty overgrowth as well. This is another patient, and you can see the significant amount of overgrowth of the right lower extremity compared to the, the left. And here, there are a couple of things to note. The, the bulk of the high signal area within the subcutaneous fat is lymphatic malformation. There's also some malformation within the muscle itself. And this vein seen on the lateral aspect of the thigh is the lateral marginal vein. And I'm not sure if it's how well it projects, but if you concentrate on the, the lateral aspect, this is the, the marginal vein, which then continues superiorly and ends up within the internal iliac vein. The, the problem with leaving these uh, persistent embryonic veins is because they are essentially you know, uh, incompetent, over the course of the patient's lifetime, these get very large, become very uncomfortable, with, especially with prolonged standing or exercise, and they are prone to fall of, uh, thrombosis. Uh, this is a child that then went in for debulking of, of his lower extremity, so the child with syndrome. As you can see, straight after the procedure, he decompensated and was brought to IR, and there's a large uh, thromb uh, embolus sitting in his RPA, which we would then from thrombectomy. So we reviewed all of these patients, um, patients with CLOVES and KTS, and you can see there's a significant number, about 12.5% of patients with KTS and about 9% of patients with CLOVES that have symptomatic thromboembolic events. And I'm sure there are a significant portion that uh, have sub subclinical thromboembolic events. As with all of these vascular anomalies, all of these patients are seen with interdisciplinary care. We have uh, yeah, hematologists and dermatologists. We have interventional staff, surgery, as well as uh, support groups, as well as social work. In terms of medical treatments, you know, these patients are given antibiotic plus cellulitis. Cellulitis is a drug that's used very commonly at vascular anomalies. And in this setting, it tends to decrease the amount of uh, lymphatic leakage, as well as recurrent infections. And some of these patients will require anticoagulation because of their thrombophilia. These are some of the techniques we used for Clipotenone syndrome. Now, in terms of exactly what we treat, we start off by treating the, the persistent embryonic veins. You want to treat those early in life so that before they cause symptoms and give the opportunity for the deep venous system to develop. So a couple of things to keep in mind in terms of the technique of performing laser, which is what we do with the bulk of the marginal veins, is that this, these veins are grossly abnormal. They don't really have a sheath. So what this requires is performing EBLT in very small portions. So this is a, a patient that we're performing endovenous laser on. All it's under ultrasound guidance. And all you're doing is just uh, administering about 100 joules per centimeter to the vein after administrating tumescent. And after performing an EVLT, we just lace this with uh, uh, STS to decrease the risk of recanalization. So what we're looking at images here are uh, pre-procedure venography, intra-procedural, and post-procedure venography. So this vein here on the lateral aspect is the lateral marginal venous well. And this uh, branching vessel is then joining the sciatic vein, another uh, persistent embryonic vein. So what we do is try and treat these uh, combination of these uh, veins. The lateral marginal vein, because it is superficial, we can treat with a combination of STS and endovenous laser. The uh, sciatic vein, because of its uh, proximity to the sciatic nerve, needs to be treated with embolization. So we can see, but see here, immediately after the procedure, there's significantly more uh, increased flow within the deep normal uh, femoral vein. This is another child with uh, simple, similar sort of findings. This is the lateral marginal vein, and then this is the sciatic vein. Both of these journey, draining into the internal iliac vein. And what we've done here is to embolize the sciatic vein and then perform endovenous laser of the marginal. 
One other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these patients will have uh, lymphatic vesicles, and we saw that in one of the other other slides uh, earlier. So a lot of these vesicles will leak lymph or they will bleed, and they tends to be the, the one thing that patients complain about most. And for that, what we try and do is to do, you can either do uh, bleomycin sclerotherapy into some of those lesions, sometimes works, but with really large lesions, prefer to use CO2 photo evaporation. Um, this is an example of a patient with really quite marked uh, lymphatic vesicles over his uh, capillary malformation. This is intra-procedural. You can get a fair amount of bleeding, especially if you, when you're uh, lasering the vesicles over the uh, capillary malformation because of the underlying veins. But once it heals, the uh, the, uh, the result is actually generally very good. There's very limited amount of leakage afterwards. And this is a different patient with a bit more restricted in terms of the lymph lymphatic vesicles. This is about a week after it started to crust over, and this is about six months post, and it's done very well. Um, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions in the meantime. Thank you. No, that was that was terrific. I I wanted to um, just ask a, another question about the presence of the of the deep venous system. So, have you encountered? Uh, I would imagine like a, a spectrum of Klippel-Trenaune patients who might have more of a robust deep venous drainage system versus those who might have all shunted to the superficial um, and lateral vein of cervelle or, or the, the sciatic veins. Um, when it comes to treating some of these patients, you know, it, are there specific metrics that you're looking for when it comes to the, the robustness of the deep venous system? Um, I would hate to, to shut down something superficial if that is their main drainage pathway from the lower extremity. Yeah, but as long as there, there is a deep venous drainage system, then I would close it. Um, obviously, that this was, again is another advantage of treating it earlier because you have opportunity for the deep venous system to develop. Treating these in essentially adult patients becomes a lot more difficult because they have the recovery is a bit more takes a bit longer. The only time I've seen patients that have no significant deep venous system are sometimes with patients with uh, diffuse capillary malformation. Um, with KTS and cloves, it's actually very, very uncommon not to have uh, some, a deep venous system, even to, regardless of how hypoplastic it is. Understood. Thank you. So cloves syndrome is part of, part of the PIX3CA-related overgrowth syndromes, and it's an acronym, stands for congenital lipomatous overgrowth, vascular anomalies, epidermal nevi, and the multiple S's that you see there. That's quite a distinct phenotype. The gap significant truncal lipomatous masses that we can see on the MR uh, on the left and the right, and the CT on the right. And mass vascular malformations can occur in you know, pretty much any location. And while there's significant amount of lymphatic malformations, and you can see here, this is actually lymphatic infiltration of the spleen, and there's lymphatic malformation in the posterior mediastinum. One thing to note early in life is the presence of uh, fast flow vascular anomalies around the spine. If we do, if you do identify that, it's important to treat that early before symptoms develop. This is the another patient with cloves. You can see this is it has a significant amount of scoliosis. As significant, and the, this is quite a distinct phenotype. We have sandal gap deformity, broadening of the feet, overgrowth of the digits, and splaying of the fingers. So for these um, management, we do advocate performing three monthly renal sonography for uh, because these patients are at increased risk of Wilms tumors. Uh, a lot of these patients are on serolimus, again for leakage, and they're all, also a new drug currently called BBYL719, I believe it has a new name as well now, that is uh, available that has shown some promise in uh, patients with pix 3 a related overgrowth syndromes. In, in terms of intervention, interventional treatment, it's really the embolization of persistent embryonic veins. But in Clove syndrome, in addition to the lower extremity veins, these patients often have truncal marginal veins as well. Let's show you an example. So this is the patient that we looked at uh, two photos ago, he came in for his scoliosis surgery. We placed a filter, treated his veins in his lower extremity, 
and immediately after the procedure, he, he again decompensated and had a large embolus in his RPA. And this was actually migrated from this vessel within, which is the truncal marginal vein in his left chest wall. So we, after treating obviously his PE, we brought him back and you can see this very large vein, which is prone to developing clots. And here, you, what we did was embolize. In the upper extremity, you know, you have a lot more leeway in terms of embolizing veins, and if required, you can embolize these these central veins, such as subclavian veins and axillary veins too. I think we briefly want to mention Parkes Weber syndrome because Parkes Weber syndrome is, is far less common than, say, KTS or Cloves, but it's important to emphasize that KTS and Parkes Weber are completely different syndromes. So Parkes Weber syndrome is a capillary malformation with a fast flow malformation. There is soft tissue and bony overgrowth, but as, in contrast to uh, KTS, here the, the bulk of the overgrowth is because of hypertrophy of the muscles of the affected extremity with uh, also some just skeletal overgrowth as well. You will see some micro shunting on angiography. In rare instances, you may see some associated lymphedema, lymphatic channel disorder, but the bulk of the overgrowth or the bulk of the malformation is within the intramuscular region. So this is a, a very early example. You can see there's asymmetry of the lower extremities. And here you have multiple flow voids but increased signal within the muscle. There's another patient with um, yeah, Pars Weber. You can see even on the arterial phase of the MRA, you already have significant amount of shunting of blood into the venous phase. And you have significant amount of asymmetry, but I was, as I was mentioning, there, there really isn't that much difference within the subcutaneous fat, but the muscular compartment is much more enlarged. Now, these lesions are particularly difficult to treat because of the fact that they really don't have large shunts. So as we talked about the arterial venous malformations, what you're looking for are you know, large shunting areas that you can close off, particularly uh, from the venous end. But with Parkes Weber syndrome, you tend to have these very small shunts or arterial or venular shunts, as people some like to call them, between, that are very challenging to treat without causing potential uh, complication. So embolization is limited. Um, you can perform some debulking if there's a significant lymphatic component. But the other thing to do is to um, have these patients followed up for leg length discrepancies. A lot of them end up with epiphysiodesis. If I could ask a, a question regarding the management of, of Parkes Weber syndrome, uh, I've heard a lot of controversy when it comes to treating patients with Rasa one mutation AVMs uh, because these tend to have a, a propensity to come back, if I'm understanding it correctly. Is there a, a size cutoff of, of the nidus, of the, of the distribution of the arterial venous malformation? In your experience, have you seen a lot of recurrence in these patients who are Rasa one positive? Well, but the, I would actually, I mean, a lot of these malformations are just difficult, I believe, to treat, but the outcome is inevitably poor. Mm -hmm. um, so if I can find, if a lesion can be treated, then I would treat it. it doesn't, you know, the alternative is you leave them alone, and we know the natural history is that over the course of the next few years, they will continue to worsen and become much more challenging to treat. Um, uh, currently, we do not have any uh, other treatments to offer these patients. So, uh, personally, if I, the the indication for treating an AVM is generally the presence of an AVM. But some Understood. people would disagree, though. I see. I see. Thank you. Um, Peter and Hammer tumor syndromes are basically result from mutation of the tumor suppressor suppressor gene P10, and so particularly. Uh, conditions such as BRRS and Cowden syndrome. There are very specific diagnostic criteria for this. Most patients will have macrocephaly. Almost 100% of, of uh, yeah, male patients will have penile antigenes. They have, these patients often have thyroid disorders and papillomas with increased risk of all of these malignancies as well. And often on uh, questioning patients, they will uh, you can solicit a hist family history of, of malignancies, particularly thyroid, breast, or colon disorder. So the BRRS patients in particular, they have vascular anomalies in almost half of those. Um, now these are 
fast flow an uh, anomalies, but these are distinct to arterial venous malformation in that these actually have a significant amount of mass. So there are multifocal intramuscular lesions. There is then progressive and disproportionate growth of the affected, uh, effects, affected extremity. Arterial venous shunting is, is not as prominent as it would be with uh, the uh, within typical AVM, and because they, there's also a significant amount of mass effect associated with it involved. So this is a patient with a P10 hematoma syndrome. You can see there's a significant amount of excuse me, fatty overgrowth, and this is the, uh, the P10 lesion. And so there isn't the same amount of shunting that we're seeing with arterial venous malformations, but also there is a significant amount of abnormal signal seen within the muscle itself. In terms of management, we can uh, you obviously have surveillance for associated malignancies. If you see a fast flow lesion and it's symptomatic, I think you should treat it. Uh, most of these can be embolized. If it's focal, they can also be resected. This is another patient with a uh, Peter and Hammer tumor syndrome. The other thing to note here is a lot of these lesions are associated with uh, with increased fat, and um, but the diagnosis can be readily established through a combination of obviously genetic testing. But if you look, if you are trying to identify these flaccid lesions, the easiest way to do it is an MRI and a, and a combination of MRI and ultrasound. And this patient was symptomatic, so you can. We decided to embolize. This the image on the left is the pre-procedure uh, imaging, and the image on the right is after embolization with glue. I will mention Proteus syndrome because it's uh, often confused with the other syndromes. The majority of the patients that have been reported to have Proteus syndrome actually are tend to be either close patients or P10 patients or other Pixies related C Pixies CDA related to overgrown syndromes. Um, Proteus syndrome, on the other hand, results with somatic mutations in the AKT1 gene, and it's a progressive disease with worsening phenotypic features. These are the criteria that have to be met for uh, diagnosis of Proteus syndrome. All of the general criteria, and then at least one from category A, two, two from B, or three from C. This is a child with Proteus syndrome. There is a significant amount of overgrowth. There's a lot of fat involved, particularly within the intramuscular fat as well. And this is a uh, particularly distinct phenotype, see, with basically a cerebriform connective tissue disease, particularly along the, uh, the plantar surface of the foot. This is the dolicocephaly that you can see in some of these patients. And the thing to note in a lot of these patients is that there is ectasia of the normal veins. Uh, especially the deep veins and uh, thromboembolic events remain a significant uh, course of uh, um, significant cause of death in these patients. So for management, a lot of these patients will be anticoagulated. Um, some patients have been used uh, given serolimus with mixed results. There is an investigational drug called Miransertib, ARQ0192, with some uh, it seems to be promising in this condition. And if you have associated malformations, then we embolize or sclerose those. But this, I just want to emphasize this is actually a very rare condition. Cloves and KTS are far more common. So in conclusion, these are a diverse group of overgrowth syndromes associated with vascular anomalies. Optimal management really requires multimodality treatment as closely coordinated into its disciplinary care. This is our, our vascular anomalies team. And I think we'll, after this, we can move on to exactly what we do for our vascular anomalies center. Um, but I just wanted to ask if you had any questions before we do that. That, that was terrific. Thank you so much um, uh, for, for, for that overview. These syndromes can be quite difficult to, to get straight sometimes in our minds. And I thought that was a very wonderful, concise review. Given the time, I would like to, to talk a little bit more about the logistics behind what a vascular anomalies center is. Um, I'm going to defer to my co-host, Ann Saylor. Uh, Ann, are you there? I am here. Terrific. Um, Dr. Chaudhry uh, has been so gracious to also 
speak to us a little bit about what goes into making a vascular anomaly clinic and center and their experiences with treating um, many of these patients in the in the Northeast and, and also internationally. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much for donating your time to us about this. We're excited to learn about this. You're very welcome. So what I will do is I thought we could talk about the way we've set it up here and in Boston and and then with a few pointers on how to set up a vascular anomaly center uh, wherever you're based. So our you know, uh, vascular anomaly center was set up by these two gentlemen, Judah Folkman unfortunately passed away in 2008, and Dr. Mulliken, who's still a very active part of the, the vascular anomaly clinic, he was there this evening. And uh, they really helped establish the whole field and they established the vascular anomaly center as well. So currently we are the oldest vascular anomaly center in the world and um, we were chosen as a Boston Children's Hospital's first center of excellence. As you can see, we have our patient uh, intake is still continuing to increase. And the reason we try and do that is try and get people excited about the treatment of vascular anomalies. And this gives you an idea of, of the, the people who attend a vascular anomalies conference. So all of these patients, people will attend a vascular anomalies conference on Wednesday evenings and then a vascular anomalies clinic on a Friday. So we try and basically have a core group of, patients, of physicians that are, uh, are available at every conference, uh, which would be from yeah, dermatology, general surgery, genetics, IR, uh, different surgical specialties, particularly general surgery, sometimes orthopedic, and sometimes maxillofacial surgery as well. And as required, we have people in different specialties that have expressed an interest in treatment of vascular anomalies, and they're, they're invited to the malformation uh, at, to, the, to the conference when uh, malformations that are pertinent to their area of specialty are presented. So, that's the only conference that we've set up. It's basically, it's a free referral service for patients from around the world. So what we do is we meet every Wednesday evening and any patient or a referring physician can send us referrals from anywhere. What we try and do is get everyone together, review the clinical history, then the photographs, followed by the radiology images, and then the histology. And then hopefully come up with a, uh, what we think is the correct diagnosis and then and recommend a course of treatment, preferably near where the patient is located. So this is a bit of an old photo now, but this is what our surgical library looks like where we meet every week. And uh, all these people are from different specialties. These are our nurse practitioners who present the cases and all the different physicians who then uh, um, offer what they think is the correct diagnosis. So all of the notes are initially sent to VAC and are summarized by one of the NPs. And then we have one of the IR or diagnostic radiology fellows review the images and present all the radiology images, and then review the photographs and then the histology. And then we have a group discussion. And sometimes we, we don't all just uh, don't all agree, but we come to, I think, a, a reasonable consensus on most of these patients. And then we send a letter back to the referrer, if that may be a physician or the parents themselves. And then on Fridays, what we do is we have a, a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary clinic. Uh, we review between 20 to 40 patients. Again, we have um, about four to five uh, NPs that are employed by the Vasco Anomaly Center. And they will basically go in initially and perform the history and physical exam. And depending on what they think is the correct condition, the different physicians from different specialties will then go and see the patient. And sometimes we will go and see them together. The advantage is really the patient, the patients and parents really appreciate this because we come to a consensus on terms of what we think the diagnosis is and the treatment recommendation. An example, just in our, our main control room in our clinic. Obviously, you can see there's an old photo because obviously we don't have the view boxes anymore. Uh, the advantage has been that really collaboration leads to uh, innovation and uh, discovery. Yeah, we have a, a very active vascular biology program. Um, we have developed, you know, discovered multiple genetic mutations within vascular anomalies, and we have multiple ongoing trials as well. 
All right. Any questions so far? Hello? Oh, no, that, that was great. Yeah. Thanks. All right. So what we'll do is, you know, this is, so I talked to Malik and what he thought would be the key steps in establishing Vasco Anomaly Center. So these are points from him. He said, start off for, first and foremost, advertise that you are starting a Vasco Anomaly Center. So people know who's, that, that it, there's a Vasco Anomaly Center there to see who shows up. Firstly, within the hospital and outside the hospital as well, and to make make other specialties aware that the that we have these interdisciplinary meetings, and that we will meet at this time every week. And inevitably, you'll get more and more interest as uh, as you explain to these patients, explain to these physicians that these patients are essentially medical nomads. These are patients that are not really well served by any particular center, uh, any particular specialty. Which is the, the which is why they're really much better treated within the vascular anomaly center, and the hospital generally likes the fact, that, especially that they will not be stealing patients from other other areas. So, we try and do it during early meetings. Identify who the core leaders are, people that are essential to in terms of diagnosis and treatment, and also of, that are interested in expanding the field. So. As far as the core specialties, I think we should have in a, a vascular anomaly center. I think it should always be an IR uh, physician. There should be surgery and chemo. Dermatology is luxury yeah, because a lot of the stuff that we uh, dermatology see, a lot of them are hemangiomas, and they can they can be treated separately. But we try and basically try and maintain them within the same clinic. But if you had to choose, I would try and get at least a one interventional radiology physician a surgeon and a designated hemonc person. And any of the other spe surgical specialties, if you can get them interested, it's fantastic. And the important thing is to start meeting regularly, regardless of how many people turn up and how many cases there are. Inevitably, there will be, you know, the case load builds up and you get more and more people interested in the treatment of vascular anomalies. And also starting up an interdisciplinary clinic so we've had, you know, in the last few years, um, you know, we've seen a lot of children's hospitals set up these clinics, and the the number of patients going to clinics has increased pretty much everywhere that I can think of. And I'm sure Fred, you found some that saw that in Atlanta too. Definitely, yes. So early on, yes, it's very important to get the right support staff. Find a good nurse coordinator, and then once once you have time and funding, bring on nurse practitioner. And then once your program is underway, then you then you can go to the hospital administration, explain the goals and needs, and then expand your your uh, your center further with uh, where, you, know, you can get social workers and nurse practitioners. Finally, yes, if you build the field, they will come. I mean, if you if you create a vascular anomaly center, they will be patients that you will you know, the patient that. A lot of these patients that we see have not been seen by another physician for years, or they've been misdiagnosed, or they've been mistreated. So what you want to do is once you set up a vascular anomaly center, you'd be surprised at how many people that you will see uh, turning up to these clinics. All right, that's it. That was terrific, thank you so much. Would you mind talking a little more about just the initial building of the clinic and building a referral network as you said you review cases from all over the world so you know what has boston children done to ad advertise this availability of the vascular anomaly clinic to physicians and to parents alike well i mean i think we, we've been kind of spoiled because it's been there for so long so mm -hmm. but the inevitably was if you start off by letting specialties within your hospital know Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time you'll see that, you know, special, you know, some, somebody's been seen by ENT for years and they've, they've been looking for somebody else to be, to treat the same patient or have another physician have some input towards it. So I think that's what I would start initially is within your own hospital. And then you can, some centers have actually reached out to other pediatricians in the area. And that's, and once you start doing that, you start building up a referral basis. And then you then uh, have a, an easy to approach 
website and a referral source. So what we try and do is, you know, any patients that come in, there's a single email that they can use or a single patient entry form that they can use that it makes it easy for patients or referrers to get in touch. I have a, um, I have a question regarding, I guess, some of the, the challenges that you face on a day-to-day -day basis or even on a longitudinal basis. What are some of the larger challenges that you've experienced um, within the, the VAC itself? I think the, the, we particularly face the challenge of, I guess, the, uh, catering to the, the needs of all our patients, particularly the patients that are coming from long distances. You know, which is why we try, it is great that there are so many local vascular anomaly centers uh, that are being created basically because it's very difficult to manage patients from a distance to be, there's a temptation to bring them in and then do as much as possible. And then, but it's very difficult to then have a good longitudinal follow-up for these patients. So I think that's probably the, the, the most difficult I find is that I sometimes will have five patients from, a state, you know, a state that's further away or international, uh, you could you have you can treat one or two times, but then you know it's difficult to have the kind of follow up that you need. I see. Uh, and do you have any other questions for Dr. Chaudhary? No, I think all of my questions have been answered. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I have I have just one more sort of a, a fun conclusion uh, question because this is a, a, a webinar designed for trainees. Uh, I always ask our, our uh, speakers if they have any advice for the rising interventional radiologists, especially for the rising pediatric interventional radiologists. What advice do you have for us and uh, I guess for the SIR space out there? I think the future is very bright for pediatric IR, to be honest. I think we're finally seeing uh, children's hospitals recognize the need for uh, having a pediatric IR service and an independent pediatric IR service. So increasingly, I think what's changed over the last five years, I would say, is that a lot of our fellows, when they finish, they are not necessarily required to do diagnostic imaging in a children's hospital. Um, I think more and more people will, that the children's hospital are employing multiple IR physicians, so you can have a separate call pool. And it, I think that's the best way to build a service. You know, it's a completely separate pediatric IRs. That's really reassuring to hear. Thank you so much. For sure. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, that was a, a, a wonderful webinar. Again, I, I want to thank you, Dr. Chaudhry, for, for donating your time to come speak with us today and giving us a really great overview of how you approach some of these complicated patients. And thank you, Anne, for joining me this evening as well. Um, we hope that uh, we can provide more of this content for you as time goes on. And uh, with that, I will say good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.